Good afternoon. Thank you for um, joining us today. This is uh, another session in our public pre-K technical assistance series. Um, before we get too far ahead, I did want to do some quick introductions. I'm Nicole Medor. I'm the early childhood specialist at the department on the early learning team. Um, and then I'll let Marcy go and introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Marcy Whitcomb. I'm the public pre-K consultant on the early learning team. And I will hand it over to Sue. Hi, I'm Sue Gallant. I am the pre-K consultant providing technical assistance on the early learning team and I will hand it to Jane. Hello, everyone. My name is Jane Kersling. I'm the contract grant specialist for the Pre-K Expansion Grant. Thanks, guys. And then we also have on our team, not present today, Leanne Larson. She's our director of the Early Learning Team, as well as Stacy McCoy. She's our Head Start State Collaboration Director. And over the course of the summer, we will be adding a few more folks to our team. So as we continue to interact with folks in the field, they'll be introduced um, appropriately when the time comes. All right, let's dive in. So today we're going to talk about some three big topics and how they're related to each other. One of them being student inclusion in public pre-K classrooms, another being social emotional learning, and the third being challenging behaviors. And we think the most important thing to note really is that these three topics are alive and well and should be present in all public pre-K classrooms. Um, arguably, they could each be their own one plus hour session. Um, so for the sake of today, we did just want to go through them briefly and sort of share what already exists in terms of resources that we can provide from the Department of Education, not only from our early learning team, but from other teams at the department as well, um, and share some resources and thoughts around these three topics. Um, they also are arguably the three most common um, questions that we get asked from schools who are starting and expanding pre-K classrooms. Um, so this idea around student inclusion, what does that mean? What does that look like it? How is it done and how is it done well? Um, social emotional learning is something that um, exists in all grades at all levels, um, wanting to meet students where they're at in terms of social interactions and being able to be um, successful in the public classroom. And challenging behaviors, which we know um, exist across all grades as well. Um, so we'll chat a little bit about how we can support schools in managing um, those um, in the early childhood grades. So we have some slides to share as always, but I am gonna flip back and forth between the slides as well as some resources that I wanted folks to be aware of. Um, and throughout the course of today's session, whenever there's a link that we click on or that we wanna share, it'll be present, presented here. Um, we'll also throw it in the chat box so that if you have access to that at a later time. So kicking us off the student inclusion, what do we mean when we say student inclusion? So a, a broad definition would be to say that student inclusion ensures that all students with physical, behavioral, or learning disabilities are included in the general education classrooms as much as possible. So to do this, we must provide the support, the modifications, and accommodations necessary for them to succeed alongside their peers. So in our last session with CDS, we talked a lot about um, relationships with special educators, right, and special education agencies. In Maine, that is child development services for three to five-year-olds. Um, and then school systems pick up from kindergarten on. So when we talk about student inclusion, we're talking about the general education public school classroom for today's purposes. Um, we know that there also exists what we call special purpose programs. Um, and that is certainly another layer to student inclusion. Um, general education classrooms refer to those that are serving children um, where the majority of students enrolled do not have a special education plan and an IEP. So uh, we're wanting to make sure that we offer all students access if that's what is the best learning environment for any individual child. 
So we do have some, some other teams at the department um, that support schools in student inclusion practices and offer a plethora of resources um, and trainings to support this as well. So it's nice to know that we're not alone. Our early learning team is not alone. We have colleagues who are also experts around this topic um, and we reach to them all the time. So we wanna make sure that schools are aware of their existence as well and how they can support public pre-K. Um, so the first being here on the left, the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. So we lovingly refer to this team as Aussie. So I'm just going to pop out of here real quick. And go right to this website here, which is our Aussie team's landing page. Um, so you'll see here that on the left hand side, they this team oversees anything and everything to do with special education services, birth through 22, um, and CDS that I mentioned, Child Development Services, falls on under this team as well. So when you come here, you'll see on the left-hand navigation that there's um, a variety of different topics and uh, folders or what have you that they offer. Um, and on this main page, they talk more about a least restrictive environment and offer some additional resources for families, students, educators, and special education administrators. So it may be that once you are up and running in your pre-K classroom, you may or may not have concerns about a child's development. Um, and coming to this page could help you further determine maybe next steps in terms of educating that child, um, reaching out to appropriate experts for consultation or to be a thought partner or to just express your concerns and ask for next steps as well. Um, you, you'll see here the responsibilities of this team and what they have to offer. And then I did just wanna click quickly into CDS's site. So if you're not sure um, which CDS office serves your school district, you can come here and scroll down and there'll be different um, options for contacting CDS if you have concerns about a child's development. Um, in the meantime, we want to make sure that even if we've made a referral to CDS, we're still including that child in our public education gen ed classroom. Um, and we'll chat a little bit as we move along today and throughout other resources around what to do if that seems really impossible. Um, there's also on, on this site uh, a plethora of uh, additional resources specific for families, laws and regulations, providers, etc. So I'm not going to click into these. I just wanted to bring them to your attention that they exist. The other site that I wanted to walk through real quick was our multi-tiered systems of support. And so the link is here. And we refer to this nationwide as MTSS. Um, and we do have a MTSS specialist, her name is Andrea Logan, and she is always willing and available to, again, chat with um, anybody from a school system that may have questions, thoughts, concerns about the inclusion of a child in their gen ed classroom. So we're wanting to make sure that schools are aware of multi-tiered systems of support, how that might look in a pre-K classroom, and why pre-K classrooms should be included in a school's MTSS plan, right? So we want to make sure that we're moving through the tiered levels of supports for all children that are present. So on Andrea's site here, again, she offers um, a wide variety of resources and information. She has a, offers a lot of professional learning for the field that you can see here she has some listed. Some are already ongoing, some are recorded, and some will be coming up in the uh, next school year. She has a variety of resources on the right-hand side here as well, and she also does an MTSS newsletter. So if you're not already receiving those, this might be something that you could um, sign on for, because like I said, we do expect MTSS processes to be happening in the pre-K space. We know that early intervention um, can really mean everything in terms of a child's development. So the earlier that we're aware of a child's needs, the better we can provide services for them, whether that's special education or through a tiered approach um, in a gen ed classroom among peers who are um, what we would consider typically developing. 
And then the third site that I wanted to bring um, attention to was for that of social emotional learning. So we have another team at the department called the Office of School and Student Supports. We lovingly refer to them as OSSS. Their site is here and I'll bring you to it here. So this is a site that if you haven't already had a chance to sort of mull around in, I highly, highly encourage that you do so because it's uh, resources and information really feels endless. Um, and the other really awesome thing about the our OSSS team is that it's really meant to support educators in public school, period staff members in public schools, period. So it could be teachers, administrators, bus drivers, custodians, you name it, whomever has interaction with the students. Um, and it's also meant to help students as well. So when we talk about social emotional learning, this particular team supports teachers implementing SEL in the classroom, and it also supports teachers' own stress level, mindfulness, et cetera. So as you scroll through here, you'll find um, all of that information provided. Our, our colleagues that work specifically in social emotional learning is Kelly Doyle Bailey. She does a really great job of organizing information and providing up-to-date um, professional development. You can see here, there's a five-part module on the core SEL competencies um, that provides a certificate for folks that are interested in going through that. She also has some other learning modules and then specifically ways to support adults. So this is where I was uh, briefly mentioning mindfulness, um, attention to stress, attention to your own reaction to students, things like that. She has some additional resources below. Um, another thing of note around social emotional learning. So there are uh, curricula that exist that many schools will purchase to support SEL learning in the early childhood classroom. Um, some schools follow the pyramid model or PBIS. Um, some schools will follow, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the curriculum. Second step is an example of one. There's one here called Kind Mind. And then there's one also called Conscious Discipline. So some schools will purchase additional supplemental curricula for this exact topic of discussion. Um, that's not necessary in the pre-K classroom, but we do ask that um, instruction is happening around this as a topic because it is a, a early learning and development standard. We have standards that fall under social emotional learning and approaches to learning. So we're wanting to make sure that schools are aware of the need to address this level of education in young students. Um, so definitely encourage folks to poke around in here and click on some of these links as well. And then I wanted to mention um, SEL for me, although, yeah, I guess, okay. I'm not sure that this is going to be me. Um, SEL for me is another collection um, similar to the curricula that I was mentioning a moment ago for K-12. Um, there are no pre-K modules at the moment. However, many of the kindergarten modules could be um, presented into a pre-K classroom. You just sort of have to pick and choose and maybe make some accommodations if needed. And in a few minutes, when we talk about um, challenging behavior, I won't come back to this site, but there is also um, additional resources from the OSSS team around student behavior, around student climate, around counseling, um, et cetera. So just wanted to make folks aware that these resources do exist. Um, and if and when we are approached with concerns around a child's social emotional learning um, or their inclusion in their classroom, we will often turn to these colleagues to be thought partners and, and to help us sort of um, figure out the best means of uh, technical assistance or resource for school. So it won't always come just from us. Uh, we, we absolutely lean on our colleagues for this level of information as well. Okay, and I'm gonna hand it over to Marcy. Thank you, Nicole. So the final topic of conversation today is going to be around challenging behaviors. And like Nicole mentioned earlier, this is a topic that we have uh, there. I mean, this could be two, three plus hours of conversation, resources, um, strategies, and um, all of the things around that. Um, obviously we don't have time today to go through all that. So this is kind of a, sort of a quick overview. And then the next slide will be a lot of resources that are available to schools around the state to help out. 
Um, so talking about challenge behaviors in the classroom, unfortunately, this is a topic that we get a lot in questions. We get a lot from educators in classrooms. Um, the main thing to know about challenging behaviors is sort of trying to figure out the reason that they're happening. So every child is going to have a different reason, whether it's just because they're in a new space, there's new rules. Um, perhaps they go half day at a, a child care where the rules are completely different and the schedule is completely different into a school classroom setting. Um, that can be, you know, that can cause um, triggers for challenging behavior. Children who come from many different backgrounds. So before they enter school, they might be in a family child care, um, a child, large child care center, a Head Start classroom. They may be home with um, families and caregivers, they may be at grandma's or just have, you know, the neighbors taking care of them. Um, so all of that is going to cause, you know, a transition into the classroom, which is, which can be difficult and be a trigger. Um, ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences and trauma. Um, we don't always see that just from looking at a child or even speaking to parents, but those are always something that may be underlying. That's something to be very mindful of. And also challenging behaviors can simply happen because the child woke up on the wrong side of the bed that morning, or they didn't eat breakfast and they're hungry, or maybe they had a fight with their parent or caregiver that morning or disagreement or didn't want to wear the outfit mom had laid out for them. Um, Four-year-olds can be very headstrong and they can be very all about me, which is developmentally appropriate. Um, and there are a hundred other reasons why children display challenge behaviors in the classroom. Um, not all of challenging behaviors are um, dangerous and not all of challenging behaviors are, or, or there are, it is developmentally appropriate for a four-year-old to exhibit challenging behaviors because they are, like I said, they're very, they're developmentally, it's four-year-olds, they're very selfish. They have an all about me, the world is about me outlook, and that is completely developmentally appropriate. So when they're in a classroom with 16 children and it's not all about them, um, they don't understand, they don't have the social emotional foundations of learning, they're not understanding how to take turns, how to wait, why why is this not happening the way I need it to happen? All of those things can be triggers. Um, it can be difficult to figure out the reasons behind it, but that is one of the first things that we do when we see or are working with a child that's displaying challenging behaviors in the classroom. Um, it's also very important to know and understand that the US um, Department of Health and Human Services and the US Department of Education put out a joint policy statement um, a few years back, but the most recent one, I believe, is 2014. Um, and the main Department of Education also has a policy statement um, as of, uh, I think it's updated as of this spring. With, there's a link here, which Sue will put in the chat. Um, and this is focusing on and regarding uh, modifying schedules for children and suspension and expulsion. The quick takeaways are that. Um, Suspension and expulsion and modified or suspension and expulsion um, are not things that we not tools that we use to for children in preschool in preschool or up to grade five actually. Um, so the school board is unable to authorize that sort of um, consequence for a child in a pre-K classroom. And there's there there is more information in these policy statements. I'm not going to go through all of them because there's a lot of information there. Um, the other thing to understand is that modified schedules, when you're telling a parent the child can only be here for two hours in the morning or they need to be picked up after lunch or we're sending them home on a daily, every other day, you know, twice weekly basis, whatever that may be, um, which unfortunately can occur, that that also needs to be made in accordance with the child's IEP and it needs to be made with parental discussion and parents, parents need to actually consent with that. It's not something that should just be happening. Um, one other thing that's really important to mention is that children who display challenging behaviors in a classroom are not always, um, they do not always acquire an IEP through CDS, meaning they don't always, um, you can make a referral if you think there's something else going on that's not developmentally appropriate. However, when evaluations are completed, um, those children don't necessarily qualify for special services because they don't necessarily have a diagnosis, especially if it's something, um, you know, that they're new to school or they haven't had time to adjust or other things that aren't necessarily a diagnosis. So those children aren't always going to be served through CDS. There's more information on making those referrals in our last session, which was on May 25th, and it's a recording right before this one. So if you have questions about referrals and evaluations and that sort of thing, you can go ahead and look at that session. There's more information there. Mar Marcy, can I just jump in and add a point yeah. of 
um, that's important for me is that the guidance around suspension, expulsion, and modified schedules applies even to kiddos that are in the referral process, and they need to be treated just as though they were a child with an IEP um, while they're going through that process. It's not okay to say, hey, until that referral is complete, you know, you're going to have half days or you need to wait out the program. It's part of their, their civil rights to have their program accessible to them. So that's just a point that I want to make clear to schools so that they know that's a really important piece. And it it helps you as well when they transition to kindergarten, if we can just work together to get the supports they need in place. Thank you. So that's a really, really important point to make. Um, that also just reminded me of something I have not put on here, but we do also have a um, statement that focuses on toilet training for incoming pre-K and K students. Um, and children should should not be left out of um, public school because they are not toilet trained. Um, and there is guidance that we have around that, which will also be thrown in the chat. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. <laughs> So after talking about challenging behaviors and what we cannot do with those children and what we really, um, how we can find out what is causing those behaviors and those sort of things, one of the things that we uh, do not wanna do is sort of leave everybody empty handed. Um, so we have put together a list of resources and things to consider and people to get a hold of if you're having these um, challenging behaviors and concerns in the classroom. Um, the first thing to consider is that the student in the student that we're focusing on um, will be transitioning into kindergarten the following year. So one thing that is a good place to start if the child is not, uh, not qualifying for an IEP or is not receiving services due to staffing and that sort of thing is that the school district is able to um, have people come into those positions, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's an extra person in the classroom, whether it's a guidance counselor who's working with the family and other support, that sort of thing. Um, and, and we often tell districts to think about what will happen with that student in the following year when they transition into kindergarten if they still have those concerns and we're not working with them this year. Because the research tells us that the earlier we intervene and get interventions and help and support for these situations, the um, faster children respond and the outcomes are much better. So that being said, if, if you have the capacity as a district or a school to put those supports in place, um, it's just much better outcomes for the families and the students. Um, speaking with families and offering family support and having them understand what's happening um, is also a really good tool. Oftentimes, a lot of questions can be answered when you're reaching to families and just saying, you know, are you seeing these behaviors at home? Do you have any idea what might be causing them? Can we get together on maybe some supports that we can do at school and at home so it's consistent for the child, that sort of thing. Um, and then guidance counselors, of course, and other staff at school who might be available to work with the families is always a good thing. Um, that being said, I will again refer to our last session on May 25th when we um, had a session with uh, CDS and talked about schools who are able to contract for these services. I'm not going to go into that right now because we did a whole session on it last uh, two weeks ago, but if you go back to that session, you can figure out or understand more about what contracting means and how those services can be paid for if, if the child has an IEP. Um, so other resources, there are a lot of trainings um, for teachers from our folks at the DOE. Um, a couple that are coming up soon would be the Maine Educator Summit, which is going to be in Augusta from August 7th to 10th. Um, this is a four-day educator summit for um, grades pre-K all the way to grade 12 with many, many different topics. Some of the topics that we will be talking about there um, are challenging behaviors. We also have a session on um, play in the classroom. We have a session on transitions to kindergarten, and I'm sure there's more that I'm forgetting, but there will be a session on challenging behaviors. And then we also are doing a similar session, although it will be different, a different, a little bit different of a focus at the main AUIC Early Childhood Conference. That's going to be in Portland this year from October 20, uh, October 27th and 28th. Um, and then there are focused regional and virtual communities of practice and in-person trainings from us at the early learning team um, from our technical assistance program that we will be offering this fall. We don't have 
um, links to share registration or more information of that at the moment, but we are working on getting that out shortly. Um, but we will be doing a once a month community practice on challenging behaviors and bringing folks together to sort of network and talk about strategies and tools and other resources that are out there. We also are starting a um, coach educator program and I'm not even gonna try to remember what coach stands for. If you guys wanna chime in because I never can. <laughs> I should have a post-it right here that says that. Um, but we'll be bringing a bunch of teachers who are maybe new to the classroom. Maybe they've um, come from higher grades and then moving down into pre-K, maybe they're your partnership, Head Start, um, child care provider, those educators. Um, thank you, Nicole. Continued outreach for early childhood educators. Uh, that will be a once a month cohort also community of practice that we will be starting. And we'll, we'll be focusing on a lot of other things, but um, challenging behaviors and that sort of thing in the classroom will be one of them. Um, another six month cohort that's starting, I believe it's the kickoff will be the 26th of October in the evening in Portland. It'll be part of the Early Childhood Conference. It's Leading Early Learning. Um, this is focused toward administrators who want to uh, gain a more clear understanding and implementation of individual or child development with classrooms and individuals in their pre-K so they have a better understanding of um, the younger children um, and how different things work in pre-K programs. And then the main Department of Education has a webinar library. Um, in here, you'll find trainings focused on MTMA, MTSS and PBIS. Um, there are many trainings for early learners, not just on challenging behavior and inclusion, but a whole host of other things, but those ones are definitely included also. And then the three resources at the bottom are other agencies that around the state that um, have <clears throat> very strong programs to help with these concerns in the classroom. I'm not gonna talk about the ECCP, the first one yet, because I have another slide that's all about that. But the second one is Main Roads to Quality, which is our Early Childhood Professional Development Network. And they have a warm line. Um, basically, you can email or call and talk about what the concern is. They have folks that will come do classroom observations. They'll set up um, improvement plans. They'll have work with the classroom teachers and in the classroom, not necessarily with individual children or families, but with the classroom itself. Um, it's a really great resource, and those can run from anywhere from, I think, one visit or one discussion to maybe, I think it's like a five or six week sort of um, program, depending on what is needed. And then the main resilience organization, or MRBN, M -R -B -N, is um, another organization that works um, focusing on um, ACEs and positive childhood experiences which um, we are, which is actually kind of new to me, but we are learning that ACEs, of course, are adverse childhood experiences. And now there's new research on positive childhood experiences. One of the biggest takeaways from that is that research is actually showing that the more children, even if they have ACEs in, and trauma in their background and history, positive childhood um, experiences, the more they have of those ongoing, can actually reverse those ACEs, which is huge research and very important in child, children developing and healthy brains and bodies and minds and everything. Um, so we have, through a grant, we will be doing over the next two years, um, cohorts of trainings around that and what they call the HOPE um, focus, which I obviously, I don't know what that stands for either. I didn't do a lot of homework here. Actually, I think I did, let me see. No, I didn't write down what that was. Um, anyway, so we'll be doing a lot of uh, focus training on that. So if you're interested in that, our emails will be at the end of the session and you can email one of us um, and we can we can put you on the list for being interested in that training when it comes up later on. And then finally, the main ECCP, which stands for the Main Early Childhood Consultation Partnership is a statewide program. Um, they did piloting the last year, year and a half with nine counties, and they actually received, um, through uh, legislation, they received full funding to expand to all 16 counties, which they will be doing this fall. They're in the process of hiring consultants to cover um, all of the counties, and they're actually having really good luck with that, which is awesome. So the main ECCP program is a program that works with um, specific children and families. It works with classrooms. It works with teachers, um, they do behavior management, they do classroom organization, they look at the environment, um, and they work with teachers to kind of figure out what supports they need and help them with that. Um, what I have here is some stats that they had that came off of their pilot program, which are very, very impressive. So you'll see at the top left that last 
year or yeah, last year, 114 classroom consultations happened and 1,550 children were impacted by that, um, which is a huge number across our state. 178 child-specific consultations happened, um, 19 child welfare, 19 were involved with child welfare children, 16 family child care provider consultations occurred, and 97% of children served were not suspended or expelled after working with the ECCP, which is a huge number and very, very impressive. Um, there were 201 home visits that our consultants did after, after having 139 referrals for service. And then they had 80 staff trainings on um, challenging behaviors and classroom management and working with families and home visiting and all of the things that they cover. And that um, impacted 812 professionals who were trained. Um, the second visual, which I apologize is not as clear as the first one. This is um, data from services from January 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2022. Um, and what we see is program type, child age, um, a little bit of demographic breakdown, and then gender breakdown as well. So um, program type, uh, child program child care centers were 81.4% of the programs that were served by the ECCP over that time frame. Family child care providers were 7.8 and public schools were 7.8 as well. Um, as part of the expansion of the program, they are working to get more into public schools to work with the four-year-olds. They also actually go up to grade three. So if you have children in kindergarten, first and second and third grade, it doesn't just have to be pre-K. And I think that's a really important fact. Um, you can work with this program and they can work with your teachers and do very similar, very similar um, programs and very similar work with the older students that you may have, which is huge. Um, ages of children, there are 4.7 were six to eight year olds, 4.7%, 82% were three to five year olds, which is our pre-K population, and then one to two year olds were 13%. Um, and then you can also read the race, um, ethnicity, and then the child genders in there as well. And I am going to hand it over to Sue to finish us off. All righty. Um, I'm going to piggyback on Marcy's comments about ECCP having had the opportunity to observe kiddos who've been through that program and talk to families. They have amazing things to say, as do their educators. So please reach out to us or to them for more information if you need it. But as we come and talk about the main resilience building network and protective factors for kiddos, we know that relationships are at the heart of social emotional learning. Research supports that nurturing relationships are essential for the foundation of learning and development for kiddos. We use the CLASS tool, the Classroom Assessment Scoring System tool, when we go out and provide technical assistant observations, as do the ECCP folks and some of the other professionals that we're working with and collaborating with from the Office of Child and Family Supports. And this tool starts with emotional support at its base, because we know that children learn best in the context of relationships where they can feel safe and valued capable and supported, even when they make mistakes or they have behaviors that challenge us. And the best way that we can teach children to be caring is to be caring toward them. We get what we give and modeling for those kiddos is really important. You'll find that a lot of um, the praise and the connection with those kiddos goes a long way. And sometimes those behaviors really are their way of seeking out a deeper relationship with you, it just comes out a little sideways sometimes. So we're here, our contact information is here for our full team and we always welcome your questions and your requests for support. You can contact us at any time. And we thank you for viewing this webinar today.